Hi, thank you so much for clicking this video. This is Part of Bithola and my name is Mujola Olewa. Today we want to talk about uh, the Nigerian Law School. We want to talk about the reflective essays that uh, law school students are required to write and submit after their extension. Now, if you followed the law school series on this channel, you know we talked about extension before and how you can uh, scale through, you know, on scathed. So please watch that video. But today we want to talk about those two essays that you're required to write as a law school student on externship returning to law school. You're required to write two reflective essays. And I'm going to read out to you from the externship guidebook, which you're probably going to get if you're in law school. Uh, just to go over what it says and uh, the requirements for the essays. Then I'm going to go over my own essays that I wrote, you know, several years ago, which I believe would be very instructive for you if you are at that stage now or if you're going to law school much later. And if you're already a lawyer, this is a good time to reflect and probably join the conversation in the comment section. Don't forget that you can always book a consultation session by using the link in the description box. It's a paid consultation session. So if you're sending me a mail asking questions and making inquiries that you should be talking to your lawyer about, they will not be attended to or I will just reply you with the link to book a paid consultation. Also for a paid consultation, also for law students. I've had, uh, you know, different experiences of uh, law students uh, sending me their assignments, their syllabus, asking me to teach it to them or to make videos on them. That's not why we are here. This channel does not uh, aim to you know, you sub uh, the jurisdiction, so to speak, of your lecturers in school. And that's why you see that even when I'm teaching something that especially has to do with the Nigerian law school, I always say that what your lecturers say is the final word. And that applies to universities, colleges too. I'm not your lecturer. I'm not trying to take over the position of your lecturer. You have paid them, so they should uh, teach you what you've paid them to teach you. This is just supposed to support whatever they are doing and to help you, you know, get ahead and uh, do better in school and uh, in your law career. So please, this channel does not seek to superimpose on their work, but rather the channel seeks to add to and to amplify, you know, and accentuate, you know, what they are doing. So don't send me your assignments. Don't send me your syllabus. I will not teach it to you. I will not make videos on it because I'm not in control of uh, your marking scheme. So I don't want to teach you something that you're go that's going to make you fail. I don't want to teach you something that you go put in your exams and then you start saying, oh, Ola said this on battle with Ola. No, let's not do that. Let it be that my lecturer said this or we were taught this in school and then Ola also said this in addition to it or in, to support it or Ola helps me put it in better perspective. And I have a feedback like that where someone said that, you know, they learned something in law school, uh, it wasn't that clear, but when they watched the video, it's there on the screen, uh, they were able to put it in better perspective. That's what I want to do. Thank you so much. So let's talk about your reflective essays today. Um, I have the law school uh, guidebook here with me. You're going to get it when you're going on externship. So uh, this is the one I got, and it says that uh, you're required to write two reflective essays on each of the following topics. One, the management and organization of the law firm where I was placed. You know, for externship, you're going to be placed in court and then you're going to be placed in a law firm. So then the second one, you're going to write an ethical dilemma, either hypothetical or real. So the reflective essay should be written based on the following structure and guidelines, title of page, the Nigerian Law School Externship Program, date, name of extern, your surname first, registration number of extern, campus of extern, heading, e.g., the management and organization of the law firm where I was placed. Playback, this is a brief description of what happened. Analysis, this may include challenges, problems, fear, or apprehension, expectation, expectations and how problems or challenges were solved, or some ways to avoid recurrence of the challenges or problems. So then reflection. This shall be on what was good and what was not so good about the activity under the extensive reflection with specific examples or illustration and so on and so on and so on. So it says that um, 
Each essay must have a logical development and coherence. It should be written in simple English, appropriate punctuations, and simple grammatical constructions. And then each essay should be typed on an A4 paper using Times New Roman font, font size 12, justify single line spacing, and 1 inch or 25.4 mm margin at the top, bottom, right, and left, maximum page number 2. So now let's look at what I did in my time and how it might help you. For management and organization of the law firm where I was placed, I talked about my law firm. I was placed in a sole proprietorship, you know, a sole proprietorship uh, uh, kind of situation. I was the only extern in my firm. I know that in some other firms, they don't put just one person, but there was a core member in my firm. I was the only extern at that time, and then there were three other lawyers and then there was the sole proprietor. We had a chamber manager or head of chambers. It was not a lawyer. And then, was he head of chamber? Let's just say chamber manager. And then we had a typist, so, and then a driver. So that was basically the composition of uh, our law firm. So I said, I had my chamber extension stint with Dash, Dash and Co. A law firm, a law firm with, with address at da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. I don't want to give them. <laughs> I don't want to make. I don't want to be particular about the location and the names and all of that. So I'm going to be skipping that. You know, during the uh, as I'm reading this, I'm going to be skipping all of that uh, detail. So I said that it is a sole proprietorship. The firm is a consultancy and litigation firm. The firm happens to be the first personal purpose built office complex within the jurisdiction. Yes, my uh, I learned this and I, I also found out that it was a thing of pride for our boss, the sole proprietor, the principal, <laughs> that his firm was the first personal building dedicated to be a firm in that jurisdiction. Other uh, firms were renting. Yeah, so a special story building, the office had as. A special story building, the office has a library, principal's office, and the lawyers have their offices. There is also a reception, a typing pool, and restrooms. Yeah. The firm has a chamber manager who is not a lawyer, so I was right, chamber manager, and a secretary who doubles as a typist. There are four lawyers, one of which is a serving core member. Uh, while we have a no There are four lawyers, one of which is a serving core member, National Youth Service Corps. While we have a number of cases in court, magistrates up to the Supreme Court, we do more of consultancy and solicitors work. It is a general practice, although there are certain recurrent species of brief, such as land and chieftaincy matters, which one can safely assume is the mainstay of the jurisdiction's litigation. The office has branches in blah and blah, hence the principal is not always around, as is more attuned to the blah branch. So I'm just skipping details. I always accompany the principal to court when he's around is Mr. Blah Blah Blah, a lawyer of over 23 years experience at the bar. When he's not around, I follow my field supervisor, a lawyer of almost six years standing at the bar, and other lawyers to court. I help carry the files, I listen to our matters as they come up and make notes. Back at the office, my supervisor explains the procedures to me and gives me drafting tasks. Yes, he used to do this, God bless him. I observe that the manager does the bulk of client interview counseling though not a lawyer. He also prepares most of the processes and files same at the registries of various courts. We appear at both the high courts and the magistrate courts in the jurisdiction. We also attend court outside jurisdiction, for example, at blah, blah, blah. The library is fairly stocked with up-to-date law reports, but there are only all federation law reports. It also houses various legal authorities and textbooks we have a cabinet storage of files in the typing pool. There are two sets of computers and printers used by the secretary come typist. It's an averagely busy office where, aside going to court, a lot of legal consultation and solicitor work went on. The principal gave the lawyers a free hand in pursuing cases brought to the firm, which is very useful in their own personal development. He also allowed them to pursue contentious matters in litigation, even in his absence. On the whole, this was a vibrant practice and a viable training ground for any bar aspirant like me. So that's my essay. Please do not duplicate this essay because it will and can never represent your own experience. These things are very basic. You should be able to get your experience on paper, you know, just like I did. So this particular essay, you're supposed to write it from observation, what you saw, what you heard, 
what you were told to do, the tasks you were given to do, you know, and you experience generally, so it's very easy to do. I am going to encourage you to do it towards the tail end of your extension before you go back to law school. And if you cannot do the, and if you cannot, when you get to law school, let it be one of the, let it be one of the first things you do, because this kind of essay, it's better if you write it from uh, reflection, you know, not that uh, you've written it before you even experienced it or that you forgot it totally and then you were just putting you know, different things together. So I submitted this and then I submitted an ethical dilemma essay which I'm going to go through uh, right away. For my ethical dilemma, the topic was the challenge of the native tongue and the constitutional right to an interpreter, a courtroom example. So uh, in the jurisdiction where uh, I did my externship, I was attached to the court uh, of the chief judge in that jurisdiction and the chief judge was um, it was in southwest Nigeria, a Yoruba uh, city, but the chief judge was uh, a Yoruba man who had lived up north, so he wasn't that well versed in Yoruba language. So what I observed was oftentimes when a parties come, he wanted them to speak English. So sometimes even when parties elect to speak Yoruba, he would uh, insist if if he tested them and he thought or uh, concluded that they could get by with uh, fair English, he would insist that they, they speak English. And uh, most times, uh, parties needed an interpreter, and uh, the interpreter was not available. In fact. So it was a tough one because the judge would go as far as telling parties that uh, uh, he preferred English. He had a way of saying that to them. Sometimes he would say, oh, you, are you not a school principal? You're saying you don't want to speak English? So how, how, how are you a school principal? In what language do you conduct your activities if you cannot speak English? My friends speak English, you know, something like that. So I put it all together in this essay. Essentially, what I'm trying to pass across is that settle down and get your experience on paper. Don't copy somebody. Do not copy this one. And do not uh, make it monotonous or something. It's not too hard. That's what I'm saying. It is your experience. Another person cannot experience it for you. So it's best if you get it down on paper as best as you can. And you don't even need uh, to be uh, verbose or to be uh, uh, nebulous. Just get it down in simple English as if you were conversing with someone inside you. Uh, the Microsoft Word that you're typing it on. I typed this myself and then I was able to submit it in school. Uh, I think we had to put it on a flash and then we submitted. So let's go through my ethical dilemma essay. So the topic, the challenge of the native tongue and the constitutional right to an interpreter, a courtroom example. A people's language is who they are. It is that which represents them to the world at large. It can also be a deciding factor as to whether a person gets redress from the courts from the law courts or not. The justice system also recognizes this in that it provides for the constitutional right to an interpreter and to interpretation at various stages of the justice process, section 36 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. While the Constitution provides for the right of an accused to an interpreter, which must be upheld by the court during trial, what is obtainable in practice is a different kettle of fish entirely. Take a judge, a Yoruba man for instance, sitting in his own state of origin, who does not have a good grasp of his native tongue, hence always a loggerheads with witnesses and counsellors, he would have them speak in English, no matter how poor. Now, this is not a problem, wouldn't be where there's adequate provision for an interpreter. I'll give an example of a jurisdiction where witnesses come prepared to give evidence in Yoruba, but the judge does not hesitate to inform them that he did not study Yoruba as a language in school. He even informs them he will not read their witness statement or not. Yes, my judge used to say this where I extend. Translated into Yoruba, neither will you remember their faces or anything they say when deciding the matter because they have communicated in a language semi-alien to him. Rather, he will remember the interpreter and whatever he has interpreted. Now, how does this work for a litigant in a situation where professional interpreters are unavailable and the court has to make do with the unsatisfactory efforts of court registrars during doing the tasks? So what used to happen was that they would say that there's no interpreter and so as to avoid an adjournment, uh, the, the, court the court registrar would try to interpret in most cases and most times. And, and sometimes it was badly done. So, you know, it wasn't, they weren't trained to do it, so I wouldn't blame them. Eventually, some witnesses elect to speak English. 
struggling hard to understand the questions and give rational answers, sometimes misunderstanding the question altogether. Once I saw a witness switch from poor English to broken English, the judge having to re-explain almost all the questions after the counsel conducting his examination. A situation like this is a Trojan victory for the litigant. We have allowed him his right but inadequate facilities to exercise him. While he cannot elect to have an adjournment in perpetuity till the services of a professional interpreter is obtained, diving headlong into speaking a language he hardly understands is another mishap to getting the redress he seeks from court. So I continue to talk about how I feel about this and the implications, you know, the far reaching and the proximate implications, even for the justice system as a whole, for the witness and for the court. So, what's the, the solution I preferred? I said that. Uh, the courts, the judiciary should provide more interpreters for courts and that uh, judges should be well versed in the language of the locality where they are sitting and also registrars should be also well versed in the language so that they can step in where uh, these things fail. So uh, I concluded. So this is uh, my ethical dilemma essay. It's published already so please do not plagiarize this. I'm repeating this because of feedback that I've got on an essay that I read on the channel in time past. So please don't, be, don't, don't put this down as yours. Very important. Just pick what you can from this and write your own experience. So these are the two reflective essays that you're going to have to write as an extent going back to law school and you're going to have to submit it. Don't forget that I said two pages. So I had to narrow this down to two pages. So you cannot talk too much and you cannot talk too less. So I would advise maybe one and a half pages, you know, just so that it's not too short and it's not too long. Remember the definition of a brief. A brief is uh, should be... Uh, long enough to cover the subject matter, short enough to keep the reader's attention. So that's all I have for you today in this video. I will see you in my very next video. Don't forget to subscribe. Toodles!